The Eighth Amendment reads, Excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. One of the major things to come from the annotations over the years is the changes in the way the death penalty is performed. But one that is taking our current society by storm is annotation that applies to the mental health of those being sentenced to death. Amendment 8.2.2.2.3.3.1 says limitations on imposition of the death penalty and cognitive ability. Does the defendant understand the reason for their sentence? Can they appreciate the graveness of their crime and how fitting the sentence is? Are they able to actively play a part in their own defense? All of these are questions that one could ask to argue whether the defendant is eligible for being put to death for their crimes. So what happens when the medical and psychological experts come together and show that the competency of a defendant and their understanding of the penalty reveals that they do not comprehend what is happening to them? What happens when you have other medical professionals giving you contradicting statements? Deciding to put a member of your peers to death when something like medical know-how and an understanding may be needed in which you are lacking. Could you make that decision? Would you make that decision? Our country is one of many that turn to those who populate it to help bring justice against those that break the law. We call that common law. We rely on lawyers both for and against the defense to paint a clear picture of the crime and why or why not the person on trial is guilty. We depend on those testifying to lay things out in layman terms and hope the jury understands the testimony of professionals who needed many years of education to comprehend what he or she just explained to the jury. This by far could be argued as the only way law should be practiced until someone points out these little confusing parts. Not bashing the United States and their justice system, and I'm not sitting here trying to convince you that a guilty woman who died at the hands of an executioner should still be in her cell today. But what if we got it wrong? What if she had to be told that she was going to lay down and have a small shot and she would go to sleep for a little while? What if Lisa Marie Montgomery didn't understand that her life would end with that needle? Welcome to the True Crime Librarian. I'm your librarian and host, Ashley. Tonight, we wrap up the Lisa Marie Montgomery case with the investigation and exhaustive court proceedings that went on to bring justice to Bobby Joe's family. A case that turned federal due to an arbitrary line and a case that rocked the nation with its split decision on whether Lisa Marie fully understood the consequences she was handed for the death penalty or against it this case is the perfect one to dive into that could make you change your mind warning this episode contains graphic detail of child abuse child sexual assault murder and adult language listeners discretion is advised If any of this may be too much for you, please skip this episode or have someone listen with you or for you.
Good evening, all of my true crime nerds, and a very happy Halloween to you all. I hope you all enjoyed this very fun and spooky holiday, ate a little too much candy, watched many slasher films, and adored the costumes of trick-or-treaters who invaded your evening. We have just a tiny bit of housekeeping to get to tonight. First, thank you to all who have reached out and asked how you can help the show. And that, of course, is through honest-to-goodness reviews and recommendations. If you don't have social media, don't worry. You can still help by leaving a review on your podcast app. Or if you're on the YouTube, liking the video and subscribing are the perfect way to help the show. These mean so much more when they are unprompted and random. So don't forget TTCO when the next time someone asks you for something good, to listen to. Lastly, we are close to the season finale of TTCL. It will be here before you all know it. So if you do have social media, make sure you are following the librarian on whichever platform you love the most. During the in-betweens of seasons, I'm active on there throwing some throwback cases and tracking the ones making headlines. And every once in a while, we throw some stuff in there just for laughs. Be on the lookout for TTCL on Patreon in the coming weeks. Enough of that. Let's get to what you all came here for. The true crime. So last week I introduced you to Bobby Jo and her family, which included her dogs, that she was using to make her breeding business a success. I also filled you in on her untimely and horrific death at the hands of a woman who wanted to be the mother of her baby. One that she could claim as her own and of her newest husband. She was desperate, so she took the life of a caring and loving person who in the past had stuck her neck out for Lisa to keep her from being ostracized from the rat terrier breeding online community. The moment she crossed state lines from Missouri into Kansas, Lisa Marie committed one of the rarest federal crimes in our country to date, federal kidnapping. Becky Harper was in a state of shock as Sheriff Ben Espy began barking orders with the paramedics in the room working on what they were positive was a dead mother and a missing newborn. The words that the umbilical cord was cut ringing through his ears. This wasn't just the most brutal murder anyone could ever see. This was now a kidnapping. But for a conventional kidnapping, they have a description of what the child looks like, but not here. Not with this one. Everyone was excited to meet Victoria Joe in one short month. No one had a clue as to what this baby looked like. And with it being taken prematurely, they could be racing against the clock. There are hundreds of different risks with being born early. The major one, lung development. The last vital organ to develop in the 40 weeks of pregnancy is the lungs. This is why women who enter into early labor are pumped full of steroids. Doctors are trying to keep the baby in the safest or what used to be the safest place on earth for as long as possible. In there, the oxygen needed for growth and development comes from the oxygenated blood of the mother. The need for lungs capable of going through the respiratory process isn't needed until the final few months of pregnancy as the baby prepares for their birth and taking that first breath. One that all mothers who have birthed a child either through normal delivery or cesarean listen for the moment they know their baby is born and it's that beautiful scream, that sound of healthy lungs screaming as it works through the trauma of just being born. Bobby Joe and Zeb's daughter was out there without either of them. Is she breathing okay? Did she survive a traumatic birth? Does the person who has her know what to do for her? And can she survive something so heinous? 
With the recent murder of Lacey and baby Connor Peterson and the arrest of husband Scott Peterson, Espy sent deputies down to the Kawasaki plant to talk to Zeb because suspect number one, we all say it, let's say it together, is always the spouse. As true crime nerds, we know that nine times out of ten in a crime as personal as this, we know that the murderer is someone close to the victim. Killing a stranger in this way isn't unheard of, but sure as hell isn't a common occurrence. So Zeb unknowingly performing his job duties is fixing to have the police show up to his job and shatter his world. But it wouldn't take long before his name was free and clear. Espy began talking to the neighbors, hoping to see if they had seen anything that could help. Leads... That is the first stop when investigating any crime. What does everyone know? One neighbor told him of a red car with a big H on the hood was seen out in front of the Stennett's home. Becky told Espy that Bobby had someone coming to her home just before three to look at adopting one of the pups. Her name? Darlene Fisher. Espy had investigators start working on Bobby Joe's computer, hoping to find some sort of communication between Bobby and Darlene. This is especially important and furthers this investigation. Espy puts out a bug in nearby law enforcement's ears. Be on the lookout. We're looking for a red car, big H on the hood, possibly dirty. And within minutes, he gets back that a red car is involved in a high-speed chase. No infant has yet to be identified in the car, but officers were still in pursuit. Espy jumps into his cruiser. The deputies that he could spare, they jump into theirs and they take off in the direction of this chase because this could be their guy. Well, once on scene, Ben learns that the guy had some unpaid tickets and he ended up leading police on this chase out of fear of being arrested. There's no baby. There's no evidence of him being part of this murder. His first lead dies in the water. Back at the Stinnets, they had a little bit of success going on with Bobby Joe's computer and this mysterious Darlene Fisher. They figured out pretty quickly that she said she was from Fairfax, Missouri, just one county over from Nottoway County. So Espy and his men, who he could spare, crawled back into their cars and headed to Darlene's home. Guess what they didn't find? Darlene Fisher. Why? Because the address was bogus. Lisa probably passed some of those heading to the scene on West Elm Street as she was leaving the scene from West Elm Street. She pulls over about five, ten minutes away from the home and she cleans the infant off and suctions out the airway with that little bulb syringe. Most of us use that as a booger sucker on our children. You know what I'm talking about, that little blue thing. She's got that and she is clearing the airway. But when an infant is born, this is an important tool to doctors and nurses because we've got to get mucus and amniotic fluid out of the airway so when that baby does start to pick up its own breathing, it doesn't suck in this liquid, possibly causing choking, pneumonia, anything that could cause harm and possibly take the child. And so she is prepared for this moment. She brought with her this syringe. Lisa also clamps down the umbilical cord with a clip, which is similar to what is being used in hospitals. We've all seen it on our children. We know what it looks like. Again, she is prepared for this moment. Now, up until that point, she did have to actually hold the umbilical cord closed with her fingers until she felt she was a safe distance away from the home where she could pull over and take care of what needed to be done. Because when Lisa walked out of that house, Victoria Joe was stuffed into her jacket and Lisa's fingers were promptly clamped down on that umbilical cord so that she did not bleed out in the process of trying to kidnap her. Finally, Lisa does one more thing. And this really kind of threw me. When I was looking through this investigation, 
you know, I'm looking at these things and I'm saying premeditated, 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 but then she does this shit. And I'm like, um, so that might not have been the best idea. Well, she picked up the phone, her cell phone, and she called her pastor from the first church of God to let him know she had just given birth. And now into full swing is Lisa's plan to incorporate the child into her custody. All of this is in motion. Again, you can go back and say premeditation, right? But then again, this could be her coming back into reality. We'll get into this a little bit later. On the evening of December 16th at St. Francis Hospital, doctors have pronounced Bobby Joe dead. Sheriff Espy has spoken with Bobby Joe's doctors and learned that there is a chance that Bobby Joe's baby was still alive. She had been far enough along that Victoria Joe's lung should have been developed enough that there would be minimal risk to her safety and her mortality. So Sheriff Espy knew in that moment his next step, and it's to get with the Amber Alert system in Missouri and get something out there and get people looking for this child. Because his thought is, if I find the baby, I find the killer. So what's the easiest thing to look for? We have no idea what our killer looks like, but now we have this infant. Is there anybody out there that wasn't pregnant that has just been hit with an infant? It's, you know, is there anything fishy? So he, he seeks it out, but we've, we have a problem. All Amber Alerts have a description of the child taken and or of the person who kidnapped the child. And with great luck, you have both of these. But here we're looking for a child no one has seen and her abductor, which no one has seen. We have no form of anything to share with the public and what to even have them be looking for. But Ben Espy is pushing for something that no one has done since the induction of the Amber Alert system in 1996. Here's the thing. Once law enforcement have been notified about an abduction of a child, they must first determine if the case meets Amber Alert plans and criteria for activating the Amber Alert. Whether local, state, or regional, each area establishes its own Amber Alert plan criteria. So what is good for Texas is not the same as it would be in Missouri. What's good for the United States isn't the same that it would be for in Australia, which is one of the countries that have adopted this system. So you're looking at different criteria. Well, Missouri, they're still in the process of actually solidifying what their criteria is, but it's very clear. Ben does not have the information needed in order to issue this Amber Alert. He knows that the child has been abducted. He believes the circumstances surrounding the abduction indicate that the child is in danger or in danger of serious bodily harm, possibly death, but he's lacking enough descriptive information about the child, abductor, or the vehicle to be, to be believed involved in it. The state of Missouri denies issuing an Amber Alert for the fetus. There was no information for either the infant or the kidnapper. I mean, we met the first two, but that third one, there's specifics that have to be met. And even though we know there's a child missing, we know there's a person who murdered a mother and ripped this child from the body, there's not enough information. And you know, I'm thinking about this now that, you know, I'm sitting here and I'm talking about it out with you guys. And I think even if he had some sort of description for the abductor, I think there still would have been an issue had he not had a description for Victoria Joe. I think there still probably would have been like, mm, but see, you don't meet all of that third sub points. You know what I'm saying? So 
you know, this is a, a battle. The Amber Alert System has been an amazing tool for investigators and law enforcement in recovering children before something grave happens to them. It's been an amazing tool. However, it came on the heels of a horrific crime. Here we are. We need to use this great tool, but we don't have everything. So without the Amber Alert, Espy can't hold up his end of his promise to Zeb. And when he had talked to Zeb and they had cleared him of his wife's murder, Espy promised him, I'm going to find your daughter and I'm going to bring her home. Well, that promise may have been broken before he even got started. Here's another step that we need to look at because this had to have taken some planning. Women go into labor regularly starting around 37 weeks, a high ratio being of first-time mothers. Well, Bobby Jo was a first-time mother. She was 36 weeks pregnant at the time of her death. The person who killed Bobby Jo had to be familiar with the development of the fetus and know that the chance of survival at that point is high when, when, you know, if they need to be taken early or if they're born early. And that taking an infant at this stage would be the best. I know that you're all going, what the hell are you saying? Let's travel into the mind of a crazy, insane person who wants to kidnap a baby out of somebody else's stomach. If you are looking for the most absolute best window, you need to take into account a few factors. Survival rate of the infant taken at this point in development. The know-how, because that's really important, which we know that Lisa watched quite a few videos thanks to the internet on how to do so. You also have to look at the chance of the mother that you've chosen going into labor. If you know that at 37 weeks, things for things that need to happen for labor to occur begin happening in those last four weeks, you know at 36 weeks, the infant is far enough along that the chance of survival is high as long as you don't get in there and do something like go too deep. Um, and you know that the chance of early delivery is still relatively low at 36 weeks. It's not unheard of because a lot of babies have been born prior to and survived. You know, we've, it's great to hear when some, when an infant is born way too early and they still have that fight, that drive to, to survive. But when you're trying to plan something of this magnitude, you have to take into account these things. So, Lisa did. Lisa knew she followed along with Bobby's pregnancy because she was sharing, you know, her own pregnancy story about her own child. And they were, they were connecting on that level. So Lisa was fairly certain how far along Bobby was, where she was, and her window of opportunity was during this week. And she struck when the, you know, at the most opportune time. At this point of the investigation, Lisa was well past the state line and into part two of her plan. She was not actually driving back to Melbourne, Kansas. Instead, she was on her way to Topeka. She had told her family that she was going to Topeka that day to go shopping so she drives over there and she's going to park across the street from a birthing center and the parking lot is actually the parking lot of a lawn john silver and she picks up the phone she calls her husband and she says hey honey how's your day going yeah good mine oh i i give birth to our daughter that's how that conversation went in my head i don't know if that's how that happened but it, it happened that way in my head 
she's already she's at this you know stage three of her plan she's now incorporating her husband and being like surprise had her kid while i was shopping sorry i didn't call but can you come get me so kevin loads up two of lisa's kids her i think it's her oldest daughter and her son and they drive to topeka to go pick up lisa who you know had just given birth while she was shopping no big deal SB is chasing a ton of leads at this point and utilizing every man he can get from whatever jurisdiction they're in. And now they're going door to door in Skidmore asking each resident individually and seeing what they knew about what happened that afternoon. A lot of residents in Skidmore were completely and utterly in shock, you know, because we were home and we didn't hear anything. How how could something like this happen? You know, at this, this just doesn't make sense. But he does get a tip. He gets a tip from a resident about somebody local who had played a part in selling babies on the black market for roughly $6,000 a child. Little would come from this lead as when SB got to the man, he tried interviewing him and learned that he was a deaf mute. So the entire conversation SB had with him had to be written down. He learns very little from him that is pertinent to this case. He's no longer a suspect. Another lead come and gone. The good news is that the forensic team found some blonde strands of hair at the crime scene. Well, I've showed you pictures. If you watch the YouTube video or seen anything on social media, you've seen Bobby Jo last week. She's dark headed, dark eyes, very beautiful, very sultry looking. She didn't have blonde hair. We know these don't belong to her. These have to belong to this Darlene Fisher I mean, she's the last person they are confident was in the presence of Bobby Joe prior to her death. Well, now the FBI was there and they're working with SB and every other department that had to come in and help him with this missing child and a brutally murdered Bobby Joe. SB at this point is also seemingly updating reporters every other step in this investigation. The small town of Skidmore and Nottoway County, they wanted answers. This was a safe area to live in. Topeka had the description of the car from their neighboring state as Lisa was riding back to, to Melbourne with their daughter tucked in between herself and Kevin in the truck. Her oldest daughter and son are in her car, which is the car everybody's looking for. So in my mind, I'm going, oh my God, they're going to get the kids and they're going to have the wrong people, right? They don't. Everybody makes it home safe. Um, but there's some serious questions about whether Lisa should have still been in the hospital. But Lisa, you know, plays it off. They're like, why are you... Why are you in your car? Why aren't you in the heart? You just had a baby. And Lisa's like, oh, no. See, they made me drink a whole bunch of apple juice. And as long as I could hold that down and go to the bathroom, there really wasn't any reason for me to stay. And our daughter, well, she's perfectly healthy. So they released her. So we can go home now. Like it's an in and out, went to the ER, had a baby. They kicked us out kind of thing, right? Lisa's children are beginning to question their mother and her actions following the birth of their youngest sister. Many people had already talked to them about their mother and the fact that, you know, she was not capable of having any more children. And that in itself played a huge part in why the children were questioning what was going on. But also, they have seen her. They live with her. There wasn't this, you know, right before women give birth, it seems like they almost round out. You know, we've all seen those women who are pregnant and they put on like no weight. Looks like they swallowed a basketball and they're that size 
up until birth. But we do know women who seemingly overnight, they went from no weight at all to really rounding out right before birth. It's common. It's excess um, water within the system to help aid with um, production of the blood and everything that the body's about to go through. It's all, it's preparing itself to survive that. But here we have Lisa who had a pretty flat stomach. Her children know that. They've seen her in the home and there was no obvious protruding baby bump. Okay. But now we have this beautiful eight pound little girl and everybody wants to know where the hell she came from because there's no way Lisa was carrying her. But Lisa ensures her children, you know, I gave birth to her. She's your sister. You know, y'all just, y'all always doubt me kind of thing. Back in Skidmore, if the Amber Alert system team was going to keep shooting down SB for issuing out the alert, he decided, well, if you are not going to give it to me, then I'm going to do it in my own way. And he used the media to really get people looking for this newborn girl. Well, you've got Lisa's kids questioning her. Now Espy's in front of cameras going, they won't give me an Amber Alert, so I need you to be look on the lookout for this. You've got all of this coming into play. And Lisa's just like, I had a baby. Everybody, you know. Tell everybody, shot it from the rooftops. Now there's tension growing between SB and the PR guy with the FBI. They have not even reached the overnight hours. And still, they know very little about Darlene Fisher. They know very little about what happened prior to Bobby Joe's death in between Becky calling her daughter and walking to their to her home to find her brutally murdered. You know, they're grasping at straws because there's literally nothing to go on. In such a small community, they had hoped somebody had seen something useful. But in the day and age of the internet, we have something even better going to work out for SB. Patience is the virtue in this case. The connection from how Darling got to Bobby had everybody kind of questioning things. And there was a certainty that Darling initially could have been interested in the dogs or it was if she feigned interest in the dogs. And how Darlene eventually did get inside of Bobby's inbox. Well, that comes from the very well-known breeder in Kansas. The one that doesn't like Lisa because of her small lies that she likes to tell all the time. He is the one who spoke with Darlene initially and he bridged that gap between the two of them and led her to Bobby because he genuinely thought Darlene was only interested in the dogs. However, had he known he was talking to Lisa, things could have been a little bit different. Espy was not giving up on his pursuit for the alert, even though he had gone to the media and used them, and they are slowly starting to kind of connect the dots between who Darlene Fisher is and how she got to Bobby Joe. So he's got this going on in the background, playing connect the dots, and in the foreground, he is pursuing heavily this Amber Alert. He decides, you know what? I know Congressman Sam Graves. I've known him for some time. He's up for re-election. And this would be one hell of a way to get his name positively in the media. So he reaches out and he says, you know, I need help. I, I have this missing infant. It was a fetal abduction. I have nothing to go on. I need help from the community. I need them to be on a lookout for an infant. And Sam is very up front with him. He says, there are certain things that have to be met with an Amber Alert. However, I'm going to call and see what I can get done. And, you know, fingers crossed kind of thing. 
Well, the law in Missouri is still kind of being figured out and deduced down into something everybody can agree on and say, yes, that's now a law. You now have to follow it in this manner. Since it's not really there, there was a little bit of leeway for Sam. However, that doesn't mean that he's some masterful person who can go in and change things. And he tells Espy, you know, I'll call you back. You know, we've got this law thing. I don't know what I'm going to do. And Aspie tells him, change the fucking law. That's what you do. That's what you are elected to do by the people inside of Missouri. Change the fucking law. And that's it. That's where the conversation ends. And so Sam does what he can. And... Next thing you know, it's 12.45 a.m., the early morning hours of December 17, 2004, and an Amber Alert has been issued for the missing fetus, an unknown suspect, in the murder of Bobby Jo Stinnett and her infant rent from her body. By the morning, Iowa has this Amber Alert, Missouri has it, Kansas has it, New Mexico has it, and Nebraska they all have their hands on Espy's Amber Alert. Now, he's got a lot of people looking for this newborn infant because in those hours from 3 o'clock in the afternoon to 7 a.m. or so, December 17th, that's a lot of time there could have travel been done and there's no telling where this infant is. His next release on the morning of 17th after the issuing of his Amber Alert he says that he believes there are multiple people to be involved in Bobby Joe's murder. He thinks that the scenario is one had to strangle her while the other began cutting away at the body in order to get the infant out. Because when he talked to medical professionals, they say you have four minutes from the time that the the mother dies to the point that you need to have the baby out before things start going wrong with the infant. Four minutes is almost impossible for those who are trained. It's definitely impossible for someone who has no idea what the hell they're doing. So in his mind, the only logical way is it was two people. While Espy is fighting roadblock after roadblock, Lisa's back in Melbourne. She's getting ready to take her daughter. They have named her Abigail Marie. And she's going to show her off to any and everyone that would listen. Some of Lisa's family said that Lisa had a cousin who was pregnant during that same time, which we know with Lisa is always a competition. And she had chosen Abigail for her daughter. And this was just another moment for Lisa to have a shove it in your face kind of thing because she's constantly competitive when it comes to her pregnancy stories. We talked about the twin thing. You know, Abigail's now twin one of two because the other one didn't survive, but they were able to save her. You remember the bullshit story. So what's another jab to all those people saying you can't have kids? You can't be pregnant, who's constantly in Lisa's mind taking that joy from her. I'm going to steal your kid's name. And she did. And she named Victoria Joe Abigail Marie. While they were in town and visiting with the pastor that she had called shortly after killing a person and stealing their baby, she develops the birth story of Abigail and how. Things went to be. And this is just another odd factor to, you know, add into Lisa Marie and the whole story of everything. Another thing odd about this whole outing and the whole story was Lisa had just had Abigail. And here they were off showing the baby to everyone the very next day. And it's a little weird because... First of all, what mother wants to get out the very next day and go around and show people their baby? Second of all, we know how risky it is to have multiple people who are not someone in your home around your infant 
and possibly exposing them to germs that they don't have a way to fight off for just yet. But here's Lisa and Kevin showing off their daughter. Another thing was Abigail had a very round head. Why? She was never actually shifted into the birth canal. And if you have given birth to your children or, you know, your wife gave birth to your children and you notice once they're born, they had this very cone shaped top to their head. They weren't, you know, Dan Aykroyd kind of cone head. They just, you could tell there was a misshaping which eventually does work its way out as the baby grows because those are not, those plates in the head had not grown together just yet, which is why they don't grow together so they can go through the birth canal. But here's Lisa Marie, this baby with a very round head that she gave birth to naturally. Another thing very concerning is the appearance of Abigail. She had bruises on her face, very prominent bruises on her face. She had what they can they described as a mild scratch just above her eyebrow. She had uh, these really long, skinny fingers, and they were very pale, almost as if there was poor circulation, which there is to an extent because when the infant is inside the womb, they're very tucked up together and their fingers are constantly bald. And so that inhibits some circulation. But once they're born and they have the space to stretch, slowly those hands will relax and circulation goes into the fingers. But most newborns, if you look at it, have very blue tint fingers for the first few days of life. The final really kind of jab of this whole shitstorm, she looks nothing like either parent. Nothing. Kevin marveled in the fact that all of Lisa's children prior to Abigail have been five pounds or less. And here's Abigail, easily an eight pound baby. That's not normal. Typically, a mother uh, has very similar weight children. Both of my kids were with, within ounces of each other. Um, my mother-in-law's kids were <laughs> very big babies. I feel so sorry for her. Um, they're very butterball turkey-sized babies. Uh, and there's a little bit of difference between me and my brother. But he was born premature. So, I mean, if you look at your children, if you have multiple children, and you look at their birth weights, they're almost right there together. It's not normal, really, to have a pregnant woman, zero complications, no problems with gestational diabetes, no problems with preeclampsia, no health issues at all during the entire 40-week gestation to have a baby significantly larger than the rest of the children. It's just not a typical thing. Some people will go, well, what about the father? Well, I can tell you, that or doesn't play a role because my butterball turkey of a husband, my kids, they just didn't match. But they were very similar to me in birth weight. So you could say maybe that Kevin and, he, and you know, how much he weighed at birth. Not, not likely, though, at all. So you have all these factors, you know, this kid doesn't look like y'all, she has these long skinny fingers, you kind of have short stubby -er fingers, I don't want to say they were super stubby, like sausage links or anything, but they didn't resemble this child that they're holding, and then it's almost as if the baby had been beaten because of the bruising that took place due to its very violent birth. Some believe that the scratch was actually uh, cut too deep with a paring knife because she also had another scratch. But I don't know. It could just be like when, this is very graphic, when Lisa reached in, she her fingernail caught the face of the infant. And, you know, 
you kind of have to handle them like they're an egg that's going to crack when they're first born because everything's so malleable as far as their bone structure and stuff. And they bruise really easily. So if you ever notice, your doctor is not like just wearing down on your child holding on. They're very soft in the touch. I doubt very serious that through the chaos that had happened during the murder, Lisa was, you know, cradling this child out of the womb. She she was yanking, we got to get out of here kind of thing. Bobby Joe had a very close friend in North Carolina, and she has just got wind of her friend's murder. And she decides she's going to get on the chat room. Her friend is located in North Carolina. You know what the map looks like. We've got some states in between these two. And she gets on this breeding and she notices that the chat room is no longer talking about the breeding. They're now talking about their dear friend, Bobby Joe, and kind of what they knew leading up to this. So this is before podcasts, really. There's still talk radio, but true crime podcasts were not like a huge thing. Well, they probably weren't a thing at all, honestly. Not really sure. Don't quote me on it. <clears throat> but it wasn't as common as it is today. You can get on Facebook and just type true crime in and you're going to be hit with hundreds, if not thousands of chat rooms dedicated to talking about true crime only. Well, you get into this one that's supposed to be nothing but about breeding rat terriers and here you are and they're playing online detectives. And let me tell you, they may not have been trained in what to do, but they played a huge role in this case. Soon, as they're talking kind of what happened in the days leading up to Bobby Joe's murder, Lisa Marie's name comes up in the chatter. She's been talking about how she's pregnant and her and Bobby have bonded over their mutual pregnancies together. And they have seen both of them within months of the murder. And it's very obvious that Bobby Joe was pregnant, but it wasn't as obvious that Lisa was pregnant and she was supposed to be due before Bobby Joe. So we have that. Now they're talking about, you know, her saying, do you remember her saying something along the lines of, you know, sorry about my poor photos of my dogs. I just can't get down on the floor and some newbie you know, took the bait and asked the question, you know, why, why can't you get down on the floor? And she's like, well, because I'm pregnant, of course, you know, she always, she had a way of, of bringing the conversation full circle all the way back to her and all the way back to her pregnancy. This is one of the things that she'd love to talk about. Well, as they're talking about Lisa and all these things, all of a sudden, Darlene Fisher's name comes up. And how she was the one that was supposed to go and look at the puppies at Bobby Joe's house. If you remember way back when, when chat rooms were a thing, you could be having a conversation with one person, but the feed is multiple people having conversations. So they're watching this chatter go on and we go from Lisa Marie to Darlene Fisher and she, she was the last person known to go to Bobby Joe's home. Well, as they keep talking this sidetrack chatter, it was soon revealed that she's looking at a fucking murder plot here. It's happening right in front of her eyes. Her friends in this breeder chat room have literally put together the crime. And then... She gets to looking at Darlene Fisher's username, Fisher for Kids. Yeah. So she held on to that username and she realized at that point she needed to get off the internet and she needed to get a hold of the FBI and tell them what she had just seen go on in the chat room and where everybody's mind was kind of at and possibly have them look in the direction of Lisa Marie, possibly being Darlene Fisher. So when the friend from North Carolina gets a hold of the FBI, 
She begs to be connected with any department. The number she is finally given is to the FBI's residency agent office in St. Joseph, Missouri. This was a lucky thing. And the friend from North Carolina, she begins sharing what she knows, what she's witnessed in the chatter in the online world of rat terrier breeders. And this tip would begin to fuel this investigation full steam ahead at this point. Agents were able to log into the Ratter Chatter website and track Darlene Fisher back to Bobby Joe. The next thing he needed to know was the IP protocol of the chat room because this is your digital footprint in the world if you did not know that every time you log on to the internet, you have a specific IP address. This IP address pings where you're at and makes it tracking it back to you a thing. Now, if you're one of the people very familiar with the online world, you know that you can buy IP address spoofers and it causes your signal to bounce across the globe and virtually makes you untrackable. Lisa Marie, and at this time, that was not a thing really, not yet. It's still developing. So they're like, okay, if we can get the IP address, we can track this back to where the messages originated. They were this close to actually finding out who was at Bobby Joe's house that afternoon of December 16th. Well, while this dis while this went on, another tipster called in and began talking about Lisa Marie Montgomery from Melbourne and the oddness about how she had had a newborn baby and how she never suspected that Lisa was actually pregnant up until the moment she all of a sudden has this child to show off. This call came from Georgia. With these two tips, and now they're tracking the IP address from Darlene Fisher. Like I said, she went by Fisher for Kids at Hotmail.com. It's pinging in Kansas, not Fairfax. SB and the FBI had the pieces of this puzzle, and they had slowly started putting them together, and it's starting to create this very nice picture of who killed Bobby Joe and stole her baby. Like I said, the IP address is equivalent to a return address, so some of these messages originated in Topeka, Kansas. We know Lisa Marie shopped in Topeka. This is also far from the much smaller Melvern. However, the messages from December 15th, 2004 ping to an IP address that came from dial-up, which makes it incredibly easy in comparison to cable modems because they can tie it to the phone number that's used on the bill for the dial-up internet. And it comes back for a one Kevin Montgomery in Melbourne, Kansas. If Lisa was Darlene like many had suspected, there was concern of what she could be capable of once she was confronted with all of this information. What injuries did Victoria Joe suffer during the violent delivery? What would happen when they finally tracked down Lisa and the baby? Would there be a standoff? Was she capable of killing the child? if she hadn't done so already. When Espy gets confirmation of the address with the tipsters that had already called into the FBI, he knew that when they drove up Adams Road to the Montgomery farm home, he would find Zeb and Bobby Joe's daughter. The afternoon of the 17th of December, FBI began setting up surveillance on, Ke on Kevin and Lisa's home. FBI was at Kevin's parents' house, and they are trying to put together the best plan possible to get Lisa's kids out of school without creating commotion, without drawing attention, because the kids needed to be questioned about this kidnapping of the Stennett baby. 
Of course, Kevin's mother is completely in shock because she believed that Lisa had been pregnant and that she had given birth, even though it's an odd story. She had no reason to not believe her daughter-in-law, but she agrees that she will go and remove the children from school, bring them back to her home, and from there, the FBI can talk to them. Where the FBI was taking precautions and staking out Lisa and Kevin, they were looking at doing so for 24 hours prior to anyone having contact with Lisa and Kevin. Espy didn't care. He wanted his people on scene, so he sends out his best investigators because he's got to stay behind and he's kind of got to corral the media and keep things out of it. They don't want to tip off that they're on to Lisa and Kevin. So he sends his people out and his concern, first and foremost, is I've got to get that baby. I've got to make sure they're okay that she's okay and I've got to get her back to her father. I promised him I would find his daughter and bring him, bring her home. The FBI had hoped as they're digging in and setting up surveillance that since Kevin, neither Kevin nor Lisa had any kind of criminal history, they were hoping that this would make for a very easy kind of confrontation that there wouldn't be any kind of standoff and, you know, they would be able to take them both into custody because at this time they believe Kevin is in on the crime. What neither FBI or SB know is Kevin did not know a damn thing about what his wife had done. All he knew was he was the father of a beautiful baby girl and he was happy as all get out. But... There's also that chance that he could have been the mastermind behind this whole thing. And maybe they had this like baby selling ring going on from their home. None of that true. Um, Kevin's innocence is maintained and confirmed through this investigation. He literally did not know that his wife was capable of doing what she did. Now... With the position of the FBI, they're waiting. And then all of a sudden, here comes the infamous red car, lacking the big H on the hood, pulling into the driveway. Out crawls Kevin, followed by Lisa and the baby. Randy Strong, one of Espy's guys that was sent to be his eyes and ears on scene, he was told one thing. You make contact with this woman and you figure out whether that baby is Zeb's or not. And if it is, you get it the hell out of there as soon as possible. So Randy Strong walks up to the front door of the five bedroom farmhouse and knocks. Kevin answers the door and Strong introduces himself and his partner, Don Fritz, as Missouri Special Investigators. And Kevin goes ahead and welcomes the two gentlemen into his home. What would unfold past this point, Kevin could not have imagined at all. Once inside, they make contact with Lisa, who is sitting in the living room holding the baby, watching television which was currently airing the Amber Alert for herself and the infant in her arms. Strong walks up to Lisa and he asks her, you know, can I, ha can I hold the baby? You know, I, you need to give me the infant right now. And she asks him, you know, why? What, what's going on? What's wrong? She still, though, handed the child over. Strong turns exits the house and hands this infant off to the very first agent and screams, demanding, take the infant to the hospital and have her checked out right now. They have custody of this baby. So the chances of anything happening to harm anyone past this point would only be to Kevin and Lisa. And this is a huge plus kind of thing going on. So they get Kevin and Lisa separated, and Kevin was very open about his events on December the 16th. He says 
He arrived home at 515, and at that point, Lisa had called and told him that she had gone into labor while shopping in Topeka, and she had delivered their daughter. So Kevin and Lisa's older daughter and son join him as they drive to go pick her up, and they find her waiting in the parking lot of the Long John Silvers, which was directly across the street from the birthing center she said she delivered Abigail at. Lisa climbed from her car into Kevin's truck with their daughter, and the two children drove the car back home. Strong has Lisa, and she's very adamant. You know, I was just pregnant. I just gave birth yesterday at the birth and women's center in Topeka. They were trying, what Strong was doing, trying to get her open up about the birth story is see if she could produce anything, any records of the delivery, any records of the birth certificate, anything that would show that this child was tied to her. But guess what? Nothing to show. Once they read Lisa's rights to her, she broke. And Strong knew that she wanted to tell him something but he knew he needed to provide her with the right set of circumstances to get her talking. While he was standing there talking to Lisa and asking her, you know, is there something you need to tell me? She's crying and he sees on her hands there are numerous cuts. Later, swabs from her fingernails would provide them with a positive DNA match to Bobby Joe. At the time, you could tell there was a there was a struggle of some sort and the evidence was there riddled all over Lisa's hands. At a little after 3 p.m. December 17th, 2004, Sheriff Ben Espy steps out in front of 40 or 50 microphones and television cameras and he finally delivers the word. They have caught the woman they believe to be the responsible party for the killing of Bobby Joe Stennett and the kidnapping of her child. This was a victory and completely shocking coming this soon following what they had to go on. They literally started with nothing and in a matter of 24 hours they have the person who committed the crime and the baby in their custody. 30 minutes following the news breaking of the arrest of a woman they believed to be responsible for the tragedy in Skidmore, tests confirmed that the infant that was taken to the hospital belongs to Zeb and Bobby Joe. Lisa's arrest made headlines across the world. There's something about a case like this, this heinous, um, fetal abduction and then on top of it the horrific scene that was left behind that left the world watching and hoping that police could find the person responsible and here they are 24 hours later and they have completed both tasks. Lisa tells Strong who SB will claim later following his retirement was one of his best interrogators from the state of Missouri. He asked Lisa the right questions at the right time and in the right tone. And Lisa was talking and she started off saying, you have the right baby. That, that's where she started. And that's the thing with Lisa and her mentality. I think that if you are going to come at her aggressively, she would have shut down. But if you show some sort of empathy in your tone and in your delivery, she longs for that so much so that she will provide you with whatever it is you want to know in order to keep getting that kind of emotional response from you. And I think that's where this plays into being the best interrogator in the state of Missouri for Strong was he recognized what she was lacking and he provided that in order to get this confession from her. Lisa says, 
Quote, I lied to my husband about giving birth to a child. I drove west from Skidmore, stopping at about seven miles outside of town to stop and clip her belly button and put the bloodstained blankets in the trunk after I cleaned the infant up. Inside of her trunk of the red car, they would find the blankets along with the rope they believe she strangled Bobby Joe with and the paring knife she used to perform the at-home cesarean delivery. Then she admits that she called her pastor and told him of the delivery of her and Kevin's daughter within 10 minutes of leaving Skidmore. Lisa had thought about every step of her story right from the get-go. This had to play out perfectly in order to sell the story to a husband neighbors, friends, acquaintances in Melbourne. Everybody questioned whether she had been telling the truth about her pregnancy, and now it was her time to shine and she was going to sell it. The story was Lisa's story, but the longer she was in custody, the more it changed. She began to slowly detach herself from the crime up until the point that she says Someone just handed her the infant. And this could be the sudden change in reality for Lisa. And I say this in the manner of there could have been a, a type of psychosis that Lisa entered into in the moment she put the whole plan into action and left her home in Melvern and headed towards Skidmore, Missouri, instead of Topeka, where she had told everybody she was going. At that point, there could have been this slip in her mental health, and she developed this kind of nest egg around her psyche in order to keep what she was fixing to do from causing any more damage. We watched her detach herself through reading. We watched her detach herself through online chatting and I think that there's a possibility she detached herself from the moment she got into the car, pulled out of her driveway, and put into plan the murder of Bobby Joe and the kidnapping of her unborn child. Now she's in custody, and I think that psychosis is shifting back into reality. But in order to protect that part of her that had to be present and had to do the things that she did inside of that home on West Elm Street, I think there's a barrier that prevented her that as she became more stable, it prevented her from actually remembering what had occurred. I'm not a psychologist. I've done some studying in psychology and if you're going to argue that Lisa Marie had all of the things that we've talked about in her past with PTSD, depression, bipolar disorder, it would not surprise me if that was what we saw occurring here. Her brain was like, oh, we've done something terrible and we need to block that off because we're not healthy enough to deal with it. And now these people are asking questions and the more that her brain comes together to protect itself, the less she remembers to the point that the only thing she does remember is I had no baby and then all of a sudden there was a baby in my arms. So someone had to put it there. It wasn't me. And I think that's where they saw this change in her story. She confessed from the get-go, you know, once they had caused her to have that break, she confessed the story. But as, as the seriousness of this settled, her brain went, nope, and put a big old unpenetrable dome over that memory. Nope, no longer. So now she can't remember. She can't remember the story she told you because the only thing she can remember is having no baby in her arms and then the next thing she knows, there was a baby. The charade with Kevin and the doctor's appointments is something that was heavily focused on with this line of questioning with both Lisa and Kevin. And, and Kevin admits, you know, there was a couple times that Lisa and him would get in the truck 
and they would be heading off to the doctor's appointment. And one time, Lisa claimed to be so sick she made him pull over and then turn around and take her home because she just didn't think she could make it through. When she got home, she pretends to call the doctor's office and tells them, you know, she's ill and I won't be able to make it, canceling the appointment. The next time he says they were on their way out, she starts a fight with Kevin and eventually forces him to turn around and take her home, where she promptly gets in behind the wheel of the truck and goes to the doctor's appointment alone. There is a huge, like, I mean, and it came from the ex-husband. Carl asked, you know, I went to doctor's appointments. I was there for sonograms. I saw her give birth to our children. How did you not see these things? And I think for Kevin, he didn't want to see these things happening. He wanted it to be true. He wanted her to have a child, his child. He wanted it to be their daughter. And if that means that he had to be shunned from every milestone during the pregnancy, it would all be worth it in the end once he had his daughter. And I think that's where Kevin kind of was acceptant of Lisa not, you know, being able to take him to doctors, no, not showing him sonograms, things like that. Carl is, I have a, I have a few issues with the ex-husband, but I think I'm going to shut my mouth for now about it because I could be totally wrong. Now this whole thing is out of Espy's hands. Kevin has been cleared from any of him being involved of the murder and the kidnapping. Now that this whole thing is out of Espy's hands and Kevin has kind of been cleared of any wrongdoing, they, they start to believe that he really did not know what his wife had been doing. It falls into the hands of the U.S. attorney, Todd Graves. His first statement updating everybody about Tori Joe is what she came to know. Her name is Victoria Joe, but she is known as Tori Joe. He let the he let the community and the nation know that Tori had been reunited with her father and family and that she was doing great. Now it was time to figure out what exactly happened that afternoon inside of the Stennett home and began building his case against the woman who did the unthinkable. The first thing to do was charge her, and that is what Todd Graves did. Lisa was charged with kidnapping resulting in death, which was punishable by death or a mandatory life sentence and a $250,000 fine. Lisa was never going to see her children again as a free woman. She would miss the births of her grandchildren, and as far as Kevin is concerned, he was going to be active in freeing his wife from the death penalty at the very least and possibly get her the best treatment she could have and what she very much needed. Lisa Marie Montgomery was scheduled for her first court appearance since taking into custody for December 20th of 2004. This is where they would actually formally charge her with kidnapping resulting in the death of a person. It was unclear at this point if there was going to be any state charges arise from either Kansas or Missouri, but Lisa was extradited back to Missouri where she would stand federal trial for her charges. She would be paraded in and out of the courtrooms for the next two years. Her defense was working for her, and their first claim, pseudosiesis, which is a condition in which Lisa believed that she was actually pregnant, and as the time came for her to have the baby, it's possible her psyche broke, and she became desperate for finding a baby, leading her to drive to Skidmore and murder Bobby Joe, then take her unborn child and flee. She told everyone that would listen to her that she had given birth to her daughter all while shopping in Topeka. It was hard to believe that Kevin really didn't see anything that had been going on with his wife. He was free and never charged. 
he was completely in the dark about her plans and the fact that she was going to kidnap a child and pass it off as theirs. Lisa was evaluated by multiple professionals, both working for her defense team and for the prosecution. Maybe her lawyers could find some sort of way to keep her off of death row. It was very obvious there was some kind of cognitive shortcomings with Lisa. And this is where the Eighth Amendment and the um, annotation that I went into, that real long number, this is where that all comes into play. If the defendant does not understand how the crime fits the consequences, there is question as to whether or not you can actually administer lethal injection. That is considered cruel and unusual punishment as they would not understand how or why this was happening to them. So her lawyers are currently working in that lane. They're looking for anything that can help them prove that she was she's not capable of understanding, nor is she capable of participating in her own defense. And it's true, Lisa had a really hard time helping her attorneys out and in, in planning out her defense and coming up with questions and seeing the right professionals. She really was not... She hadn't looked this part up. She didn't know where to go from here. And so the, the professionals that were brought in, they all agreed she's got PTSD. She's chronically depressed and she definitely has bipolar disorder. However, those who worked for the defense and those who worked for the prosecution could not come to an agreement that she had pseudocyesis. Examiners working with the prosecution agreed that, you know, she does have these others, but you do not suffer from pseudocyesis. We know this because you actively planned out a way in order to obtain a child. And had you had pseudocyesis, you would not have done so as you believed that there would be a baby born from your body. Well, there was a guy, Dr. Gurr, he was brought in and he did some imaging on Lisa Marie's brain through MRI and PET scans. He testified that there is evidence within Lisa's brain and the abnormalities that it had that were consistent with those diagnosed with pseudocyesis. However, a hearing was set to strictly determine whether this information could be discussed during the trial, courts would rule that the interpretation of the MRI could not be heard by the jury, but they were going to allow the PET scans. Well, just a few days later, following that ruling, that was overturned and the court ruled that Dr. Gurr's testimonies and interpretations would be withheld from the jury during the trial of Lisa Marie Montgomery. So all of this showing that there is visual abnormalities. You can look at her brain and look at the brain of a normal person and you can point out that this is not how it's supposed to look. This is how it's supposed to look on this normal one. Here's Lisa. They don't match up. How the prosecution cut that out of the trial, I'll never know. Do I think it's a pertinent piece of information for the jurors? I do. If there's Something physically there to prove mental health, I think it should have been allowed. And here's my reasoning why. There, whether it proves she has pseudocyesis or not, it does prove that there is a mental deficit with inside of Lisa Marie's brain that could inhibit her from fully understanding the graveness of her crime and the graveness of the possible death sentence that would arise from the trial, okay? So not too long ago, I decided I was going to break down, watch the show Oz. And so I've been kind of watching it off and on as I've done research and stuff. Well, during the show, they have a character named Cyril. He is a man who was convicted of murder. He had obvious mental defects 
And eventually throughout the show, he ends up committing another murder. And then he becomes very hostile and hard to control and is handed a death sentence. Why am I bringing this up? Because he was put to death and the way that they convinced him to maintain calmness was he was undergoing some shock therapy to kind of help him with his fits of rage that the officers were having a hard time controlling. And so instead of telling him, you know, we're going to strap you to this chair, we're going to electrocute you to the point that you die. They did not tell him that. They told him that he was going to a special session of whatever it is they called it, but in layman terms, shock therapy. He literally was strapped into the chair and electrocuted to the point that he died under the ruse that it was a special treatment. I bring this up here because there's obvious proof that there's mental defects. If they had been allowed a little bit more time, could they have proven that Lisa did not understand the connection between her crime and the consequence? I think they could have. Um, I'm, you know, where I stand after talking about good old uh, John Battaglia, you know where I stand. I'm glad that we stuck a needle in his arm. He's exactly where he should be. With Lisa Marie, I think that if there was an, a, even the smallest chance that she didn't understand, I think we made a mistake. But I can also or argue, on the other hand, she had this ex extensive plan between memorizing the directions from her house to Bobby Joe's to putting into motion the different stages of her story in order to incorporate her custody of the baby. Um, the, you know, forever kind of pulling the wool over the sheep's eyes kind of thing going on throughout this whole I'm pregnant phase. You could say there's premeditation there and with any kind of premeditation, you knew you were going to commit the crime that qualifies for the death sentence in state on the state level. And in this case, it could prove that you knew you weren't pregnant. You knew you had to commit a crime in order to sell your story. And you went through the planning stages until the point that you committed the crime. Does you having PTSD or bipolar disorder or chronic depression, does that change that? No, it doesn't. But, you know, we're back to, did she truly understand it? And I think there needed to be some more evaluation of Lisa uh, following her conviction and prior to the scheduling of her death sentence. So, I'm on the fence with this one, you guys. <laughs> you know, there's so much diversity when it comes to Lisa Marie's trial. You've got pro-lifers on one side. You've got pro-death row on the other. And then you have these people who, you know, we could go either way. We stand in the gray. And you've got to look at everything. And I mean everything in order to really kind of see this story as a whole. There's premeditation. 100%. I will give you that. But what I want to know, and I don't think there's enough information out there and there needs to be, is whether or not she actually understood how you went from point A to point B. The other thing I'm going to have a really hard time is if they did actually tell Lisa, we're going to take you down here and, and you're going to get a shot and you're going to go to sleep. If they did not tell her what was going to actually happen, that she would not wake up, that this would end her life. Yeah, we have some problems with cognitive ability here. And there may be a leg to stand on for her family. I don't know. I am neither trained as a psychologist or as a police investigator or a lawyer or a judge. So what do I know, right? <clears throat> Here's what I do know. There are only two people who can tell you for sure whether Lisa Marie knew what she was doing and whether she was level-headed during the crime 
and they are both gone. Lisa Marie had the support of her family and lawyers up until the very end. They were all in agreement that Lisa had committed a heinous crime, but that she was unable to see how the crime would lead to the federal government taking her life as the consequence. Once her mental disorders were diagnosed and she started receiving treatment, that those closest to her would see the woman they lost many years ago. Kevin still fought to save the life of his wife up until her last minutes, hoping to get her even better treatment and possibly saving her life. Carl knew that his ex-wife had issues with accepting the fact that she could never have any more babies, but instead of getting treatment, he, her mother, and others swept it under the rug and then almost taunted her with each of her I'm pregnant stories. When Carl could see that Judy wasn't a loving mother, that none of her family knew what it was to show love and affection, he should have shown her differently. But unfortunately, with all of the couple's problems, Lisa's hope for a happily ever after went out the window, and love and affection would be something she craved but would never know. Zeb was reunited with his daughter after she was checked out at the hospital and made statements through a spokesman for his behalf. But unfortunately, the rumor mill says that once the media nightmare slowed down after Lisa's capture, he drifted away from Becky and Victoria Jo rarely had visits with her maternal grandmother. Zeb and Victoria Jo lived their lives behind the spotlight that comes with the murder of his wife and her mother. And I believe that for them, that is the only way they can truly move on. The debate over the death penalty continues today. Some believe Lisa Marie got what she deserved, and others felt that her sentence of death should have been excommunicated to life. No matter where you stand, this case pulls you from your comfort zone and makes you look at the circumstances from the other side. I want to thank you all for joining me tonight. This has been a rocky road from start to finish, but it is one that will stick with you for a lifetime. Join me next week as we dive into the depths of murky water, revealing more bodies than anyone could have imagined. As always, I leave you with one last line. Nothing in this world can torment you as much as your own thoughts. Much love, the true crime librarian. <laughs>